You are listening to the Intrepid Radio Program with Scotty Roberts. Intelligent Talk. Thursday evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Scotty Roberts. You're listening to the Intrepid Radio Program right here on Odyssey Radio Network. That's O-D-Y-S-Y-1.com. And you can watch the simulcast in the video stream over on my YouTube channel. And that's YouTube.com slash Mr. Scotty Roberts. Welcome to the show tonight, folks. I want to thank you for being here, and if you can handle my bad hair day, look at that, whew, it's been under a hat all day, um, then I'll handle your bad hair day. So there we go, that's why the hat's on today, not just to honor my friend John Penman of Penman Hats, where you can get the best custom bespoke hats made anywhere, but it's also to cover my my balding yet messy baldy pate. How can I be so thin-haired and have hair all over the place? That's a big question. That's a mystery of life if I ever heard one. So I want to thank you again for being here. Let's roll into this today. Um, I appreciate all the uh, email I'm getting from everybody and I want to let you know something that I am not a, an expert or a uh, uh, specialist on Gnosticism. There's a lot about Gnosticism I still don't know. There's a lot about Paganism I don't know. I learn because I read. And I don't read and just believe what I read. Um, I do look into these things a little deeper. And I look at the credibility of the people that write the stuff I read. And I highly recommend you do the same thing. Don't take anything I say as the end-all and the be-all of any of this because you have the ability to study this stuff yourself. My only question to you would be, and I am making the grandiose assumption that people who are listening to this are people who are part of Western tradition, Western religion, for the most part. Our Judeo-Christian nation, quote-unquote, has been around for a long time. And even if you weren't raised in a Judeo-Christian tradition, Uh, you've been exposed to it. So those of us who are, let's say, Christian or Christianized, um, it's like when I asked my youth group when I was a youth pastor, why are you a Christian? And one of the kids said, well, more than one of them said, well, because my parents are Christian, uh, because we attend this church, etc. And uh, I said, you know, this is the old uh, comparison. I said, I can go stand in my garage for a week, but that won't make me a car. And so when I say Christian or Christianized, I'm talking about living in our Western Christian tradition and culture. So you've been inculcated into this if you were born into it. You've been exposed to it. And everything that we've learned has been that literal historical interpretation of the life of Jesus is put forward by the Universal Church, which in the 4th century became the Roman Catholic Church. And uh, all those precepts, all those creeds, all that everything has become an accepted way. So for over 1,700 years, uh, Christianity hasn't changed much in the fact that this is what we chose to believe and this is the foundation of it all. They also, during a lot of those councils that were the first one convoked by Constantine, the Roman emperor, who also declared himself em- uh, um uh, Pope of the of the Universal Church, the Catholic Church, he said he was establishing and having the bishops establish at those councils uh, the unanimous decisions of what Christianity would be, because he wanted to use Christianity as a cornerstone for his Roman Empire, and so he basically said, one God, one emperor, one empire, one religion. And that's what we've believed ever since. And at the same time, in those early days, they were wiping out the Gnostics and the teachings of the Gnostics because their teachings on Jesus, their teachings on the ancient pagan god-men, 
was very different. It was looking at Jesus as being one of those examples that was put forward of a more universal way of thinking. And so all of this, and I will tell you this, all of this really starts to spiral down to you asking the questions, is this real the way I have perceived it? Is the spirituality real? Is the is any of this real at all? Is God real the way that I was taught he was? Or is there something different at play? And so I think it is incumbent upon anyone who has abided by Western tradition when it comes to religion, by Judeo-Christianity, who grew up as part of it, uh, who indoctrinated themselves or programmed themselves into that, allowed themselves to be programmed so, to ask the questions. If there's another version, why shouldn't I be looking at it? So this is what I'm encouraging you to do as we talk about these things. And yesterday, we left off uh, just making some international comparisons, some international mysteries in the ancient world. And <coughs> Excuse me, we started talking about Herodotus, the uh, uh, 4th century BCE um, historian known as the father of history. And he discovered all of this stuff about the different ways of thinking in the Mediterranean world when he traveled to Egypt the first time. And on the shores of a sacred lake in the Nile Delta, he witnessed an enormous festival held every year in which the Egyptians performed this dramatic spectacle before tens of thousands of men and women. And it was representing the death and the resurrection of another ancient messiah, Osiris. And Herodotus was an initiate into the Greek mysteries that recognized what he called the passion of Osiris. And it was the very same drama that initiates saw enacted before them at Eleusis as the passion of Dionysus. So the resurrection of Osiris, the festival of Osiris, the passion of Dionysus were pretty much the same thing and had the same kind of mystery celebrations about them. And he recognized this Herodotus. And the Egyptian myth of Osiris is the primal myth of the mystery God-man, and it reaches back to prehistory. And his story is so ancient it can be find, found in the pyramid texts that were written over 4,500 years ago in Egypt. And in traveling to Egypt, Herodotus was following in the footsteps of another great Greek before 670 BCE, Egypt had been a closed country in the manner of Tibet or Japan more recently. But in this year, uh, she opened up her borders, and one of the first Greeks who traveled there in search of the ancient wisdom was Pythagoras. And you know about him with the Pyth Pythagorean theorem. And uh, history remembers Pythagoras as the first scientist of the Western world. And a little bit about Pythagoras, there's a, a note I have here um, that uh, uh, Semeticus allowed the, uh, I don't even know if that's the way to pronounce it, Sem Semeticus, there it is, P-S-A-M-M-E-T-I-C-H-U-S, -M -M -E Semeticus, uh, allowed the Ionian Greeks to establish a trading post in the Delta in Egypt in 670, and that's what really kind of opened up their borders. So history remembers the Pythagoreans, or Pythagoras, as the first scientist of the Western world. But although it's true that he brought back many mathematical theories uh, to Greece from Egypt, his contemporaries would have seemed anything but scientific in the modern sense. And by the way, we used to hum a little song, know your, brush up your Pythagoras, uh, I'm sorry, brush up your Herodotus, <laughs> your history. Um, when John Ward and I were working on our book, which we never did submit, uh, the, uh, uh, what was it called, uh, of, of Cambyses, The Lost Armies of Cambyses, uh, how Cambyses, uh, uh, in the 520s, 525, raided and sacked Egypt, and he put the ruling family to death, and then he mounted an army of 50,000 soldiers while there, and made a forced march out into the western desert to march almost 500 miles out to the oasis at Siwa uh, to really to wipe out the Amorites. 
and there was the great oracle at Siwa. And he was going, and by the way, Siwa is this little oasis. You can still visit that today. There's still a town there, and there's the old city there, and the old ruins. And uh, this is where people would go. Like, you, you remember the Oracle at Delphi? They used to go to also to the Oracle at Siwa. This is also where it was purported that Cleopatra and Alexander were buried. Not in, not in Alexandria, Egypt. And by the way, the, way to, the best way to get to Siwa, you go up to Alexandria on the coast in Egypt, and you take the coast road, and then you cut south. And you go down to the uh, oasis at Siwa. Well, it was um, uh, Cambyses who mounted this 50,000-strong army and cut across the desert from, I think, basically the area of Cairo and Memphis and started heading across the desert. And along the way, as Herodotus, the historian, tells us, who lived in the next century uh, BCE, told us that the army completely disappeared, never to be seen again. And there were 50,000 of them were swallowed up by a great sandstorm and uh, the wrath of God, so to speak, because they were going out to uh, destroy the Amorites and the oasis at Siwa. <coughs> and so, pardon my cough. And so uh, uh, this is what Herodotus wrote, wrote about. And John Ward and I, when we were writing a book about the lost armies of Cambyses, uh, our publisher actually, after we had written and they published the Exodus reality, uh, our book about our two different views on the historical Moses and the historical Exodus, uh, this was our follow-up book. And our publisher thought, eh, a little too high and mighty, a little too cerebral maybe. And uh, we didn't think they gave it a fair shake, but uh, uh, because we were writing this as uh, uh, a very interesting mystery out of ancient history. And Nat Geo and other places, they've done explorations looking for the lost army of Cambyses. And John Ward believed he had found them, some of the remnant of them, but he also believed they just splintered uh, after that big sandstorm and they, uh, they got themselves... Um, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for when you uh, when you go into a town and you just kind of seep in and you become part of the culture, the local culture? The word is escaping me. They seeped into the towns. They, uh, they just disappeared off the face of the map. And so a wandering charismatic sage, dressed in white robes and crowned with a gold coronet, uh, Pythagoras was part scientist, part priest, part magician. Uh, the late John Anthony West, by the way, if you remember him from, uh, he was a big Egyptologist. Uh, he called himself a rogue historian. And all that means is uh, we're historians and we've studied this our whole lives. And the academic community doesn't want to recognize us because we don't have letters behind our name. Uh, so he referred to himself as a rogue historian and a Pythagorean. And uh, that was what he did. And uh, so Pythagoras was part scientist, priest, and magician. And he spent 22 years in the temples of Egypt. And he became an initiate of the ancient Egyptian mysteries. And on returning to Greece, he began to preach the wisdom that he'd learned after that 20. You spend 22 years uh, indoctrinating yourself or inculcating yourself into a certain way of thinking. And you're going to come back uh, talking about that wisdom. He performed miracles. He raised the dead uh, and uh, gave oracles. And so inspired by Pythag Pythagoras, his disciples, his followers, created a Greek mystery religion modeled on the Egyptian mysteries. And remember, keep in mind the context. This is what the church in the early centuries of uh, the, 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 the 200s to 300s, the 400s, considered to be the pagan religions that they were trying to wipe out in lieu of their historical Jesus and their historical look at uh, their accepted way of believing what kind of person Jesus was. And uh, uh, his disciples started modeling this and made it the Egyptian mysteries. And the indigenous wine god Dionysus, who was a minor deity, all but ignored by uh, Hesiod and Homer, and transformed into a Greek version of the mighty Egyptian Osiris. So just like anything else, some of these godmen that are out there, 
were transformed by people to meet their needs. And the, he, was, he became the god-man of the mysteries, Dionysus, Bacchus. And this initiated a religion and cultural revolution that was to transform Athens into the center of the civilized world. And the followers of Pythagoras were models of virtue and learning. They were regarded as Puritans by their neighbors. They were strict vegetarians. They preached nonviolence toward all living things. And they shunned the temple cults that practiced the sacrifice of animals. Uh, that would be including uh, the temple in Israel. Um, and this made it impossible for them to participate in the traditional Olympian religion of the Athenians. And they f were forced to live on the fringes of acceptability. They often organized themselves into these communities that shared all their possessions in common, uh, leaving them to free to devote themselves to the mystical studies of mathematics, uh, music, astronomy, and philosophy. Uh, let me ask you, would you abandon everything you have, uh, the, all the trappings of modern 21st century society, to join a commune for the purpose of studying math. Not me, not this guy, but mathematics, music, astronomy, philosophy. That might have been a cool way to live, <coughs> when you think about it. And nevertheless, the mystery religion spread quickly amongst um, the ordinary people. And within a few generations, the Egyptian mysteries of Osiris, now the mysteries of Dionysus, inspired the glory of classical Athens. And so, in this very same way that the Greeks synthesized Di uh, Osiris into the Dionysus uh, mysteries, with their indigenous god uh, creating, uh, uh, creating the Greek mysteries, the, the Greek version of the Egyptian mysteries, other Mediterranean cultures which adopted the mystery religion, also transformed one of their indigenous deities into the dying and resurrecting mystery God-man. So the deity, who was known as Osiris in Egypt and became Dionysus in Greek, was called Attis in Asia Minor, Adonis in Syria, Bacchus in Italy, Mithras in Persia, and so on and so on and so on. You can see how this, and it spread like wildfire. And his forms were many, but essentially, he was the same perennial figure whose collective identity was referred to as Osiris Dionysus. And these are all these mystery deities that predated the time of Christ. But interestingly enough, how Christ's followers made sure that Jesus Christ gained all the attributes of all these other godmen. And so because the ancients recognized that all the various mystery godmen were essentially the same mythic being, elements from different myths, and rites were continually combined and recombined to create new forms of the mysteries, the mystery religion. And in Alexandria, for example, a charismatic sage called Timotheus consciously fused Osiris and Dionysus to produce a new deity for the city called Serapis. And he also gave an elaborate account of the myths of the mystery godman Attis. And Lucius Apuleius, Apuleius, some of these old names, got to look at them a little more ahead of time uh, from my notes so I pronounce them right. Apuleius, A-P-U-L-E-I-U-S, Apuleius. He received his initiation into the mystery religions of Egypt from a high priest named after the godman Mithras. And coins were minted with Dionysus represented on one side and Mithras on the other side. And one modern authority tells us that possessed by the knowledge of his own secret rites, the initiate of the mysteries found absolutely no difficulty in conforming to any religion in vogue. And uh, uh, this is uh, Angus from 1925, just so you know. Uh, when, I, when I mention some of these modern authorities, there are footnotes on all of these things. So, as we mentioned yesterday, <clears throat> I'm not just pulling it out of my ass. So, like the Christian religion, which superseded it, the mystery re reached across national boundaries, 
offering this spirituality which was relevant to all human beings regardless of their racial origins or their social status. The church, of course, didn't like this at all and still doesn't like it. If you believe that your God-man is the God-man and all the others were artificials, or as, uh, as we mentioned, uh, Justin Martyr, who said that uh, early uh, church apologist historian who said that uh, uh, all these previous mystery gods, pagan gods, were all just diabolical mimicry set up by Satan to distract humanity from the real Christ when he would come. Uh, they offered a spirituality which was relevant to all human beings, regardless of their racial origins, regardless of their social status. Uh, do you remember one of the big schisms between the Apostle Paul and Peter, the, the big fisherman, the, the disciple of Jesus, after the death of Jesus in the early days of the spread of the church, of Christianity? They locked heads, and it was Paul who opened it up to the Greeks, the Gentiles, as he called it. He said, Jesus Christ died for everyone. And it was Peter who kind of resisted him and said, no, this is for the Jews. It was Jesus was the Jewish Messiah in their point of view. And so Paul, who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, Peter, who has a couple of books in the New Testament and was uh, the, the man that Jesus left in charge of the church, so to speak, in certain verses and certain ways of thinking, that was responsible, uh, that, that we were heard, uh, we've heard in church history, was the first pope, pope quote-unquote, because there wasn't that Roman Catholic substructure yet. But these guys were in were diametrically opposed as to who the gospel was supposed to be for. And so even as early as the 5th century, and now we're talking about 400 years after this time, uh, I'm sorry, 5th century BCE, uh, uh, 500 years before this time, the philosophers such as Diogenes and Socrates called themselves cosmopolitans. They were citizens of the cosmos. And rather than, and you know, we hear that nowadays. We hear that in kind of the, I'm sorry if any of you are any of this, but like the, I look at it, I go, it's kind of a whack, fringy, the, the, uh, um, uh, the Pleiadians and the people who believe were from the, you know, they're children of the stars and all of that stuff. Yeah, it requires some study to see what they're thinking and so on. But that's what they called themselves. And that's really what uh, Diogenes and Socrates called themselves, citizens of the cosmos, rather than of any particular country or culture. And this is a testament of the international nature of the mysteries and the mystery religion. And one modern scholar commenting on the merging and the combining of the different mystery traditions writes this. He said, this went a long way toward weaning the minds of men from the idea of separate gods from the different nations and toward teaching them that all national and local deities were but different forms of one greater power, one greater deity, if you will. And, uh, but for the rise of Christianity and other religions, there can be little doubt that the whole of the Greco-Roman deities would continually have merged into Dionysus. And uh, the, the person who said that, uh, this, was, uh, uh, this is slightly adapted from Angus's book. Um, uh, and I'm not going to get into the full, uh, full uh, footnote on that. But the Osiris Dionysus merged then eventually with Jesus Christ. And right now i got to go out to break. I'm right at the end of the first segment. Just check my clock, and uh, we got to go out. So you sit there for two minutes. We'll be right back.
All right, folks, we're back. Thanks for sitting here through that break. This is Scotty Roberts. You are watching the Intrepid Radio Program with me, your host. And it's here on the Odyssey Radio Network, ODYSY1.com. And you can watch the simulcast video over on my YouTube channel. And that is Mr. Scotty Roberts, Mr. All Spelled Out. Yes, I have my penman hat on today. Go get one for yourself. Uh, all it's doing is covering this this uh, 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 thinning uh, pate uh, that still turns into a mop on the top of my head. Mostly because I put this on and I forget I have it on. And I'm wearing it all around the house and everything I do all day. But that's penman hats for you. It's uh, the every man's hat. And that is actually one of Penman's lines. So go over and take a look at what he does. You can find him on Facebook as well. Look him up, Penman Hat Company, and to see what he does. And Christmas is coming. That's all I'm saying. So let's get into this whole comparison of Osias, Osiris Dionysus with Jesus, Jesus Christ in Christianity. We've looked at some of the history leading up to this. But Osiris Dionysus had such a universal appeal to common folk because he was seen as an everyman figure who symbolically represented each and every one of the initiates. He was part of the common people. Uh, he, was, he appealed to the common person. Anybody could come and be drawn in by that exoteric information on the surface and become an initiate and learn the esoteric information. Let me ask you, just even in Judeo-Christianity, that also has its exoteric version, but when you get closer, you have to be drawn in. As the Apostle Paul wrote, when I was a child, I drank milk, but when I became a man, I ate meat. And he says, are you dining on the meat of the word, or are you dining on the milk of the word? And this is really the exoteric to the esoteric, that inner stuff those mysteries that are hidden beneath. Remember, it was Jesus who, in the Gospel of Judas, told Judas, he said, You've, you know the mysteries, you get it. And uh, whether you believe that that Gospel is authentic or not, it's authentically old, but whether you believe the story contained within it is authentic, where Judas is actually kind of a hero, he's the one Jesus went to who said, You must betray me in order to fulfill prophecy, and Judas really bristled at this notion and resisted it. And Jesus said, look, you get the mysteries, and I'm relying on you to do this. And that's where even in the Gospels, four of the 60 that exist that are in the New Testament, you find one of the books says Jesus looked right at Judas during the Last Supper and said, that thing that I appointed you to do, go do it. And so, uh, and he got up and did it. So anyway... Uh, um, the everyman figure really symbolically represent each and every person who came. And uh, through understanding the allegorical myth of the mystery God-man, initiates could become aware that, like Osiris Dionysus, Osiris Dionysus, they were also God-made flesh. You are gods. They, too, were immortal spirits trapped within a physical body. Uh, through sharing in the death of Osiris Dionysus, initiates symbolically died to their lower earthly nature on a metaphoric level. You're putting to death that, that nature. We've heard this in Christianity well. Put to death the old man and become the new. And through sharing in his resurrection... They were spiritually reborn and experienced their eternal and divine essences. Essence, let's keep that singular, their essence, each and every one of them. Essences is, is too hard to say. And this was the profound mystical teaching that the myth of Osiris Dionysus encoded for those initiated into the inner mysteries. The truth of which initiates directly experienced for themselves. This was a personal draw. Now, even I look at even Roman Catholicism, and I'm not here to insult anybody or your sensibilities, but I do look at that denomination, that religion, that version of the God-man, Jesus, and I'll say down through the ages, 
there were many, many years, up to, you're looking almost 1,600 years after the time of Christ, before those texts, that Bible, was even translated into common English. You had to know Latin, or you had to know uh, Hebrew, you had to know Aramaic, you had to know Koine Greek, and it was taught in the church in Latin. And so these were the mysteries were closed off to people. You just had to do what you were told. It was a control matrix that was put in place by the hierarchy of the church. And through sharing of all this in the mysteries, sharing the resurrection, people were spiritually reborn. They experienced their eternal and their their eternality, their divinity on a very different level than the church was giving them. And writing of the Egyptian mystery god man Osiris, Sir Wallace Budge, now you might know him, uh, an explo- uh, I, I know him as an Egyptologist. We had old map books from Budge that uh, we were scanning uh, when we took our trips to Egypt uh, and put them together. Uh, but uh, So Budge's uh, maps of Egypt. But he was the keeper of antiquities in the British Museum. <coughs> and he explained it this way. He said, this is a quote from him, The Egyptians of every period in which they are known to us believed that Osiris was of divine origin, that he suffered death and mutilation at the hands of the power of evil, and that after great struggle with these powers he rose again, and that he became henceforth the king of the underworld and the judge of the dead, of the quick and the dead, and that because he had conquered death, the righteous might also conquer death. He represented to people the idea of a man who is both God and man, blended. He typified to the Egyptians in all ages the being who, by reason of his sufferings and his death, as a man could sympathize with them in their own sickness, and their own death. The idea of this human personality also satisfied their cravings, their yearnings for this communion with a being who, though he was partly divine, yet had much in common with themselves. Originally, they looked upon Osiris as a man who lived on the earth as they lived, who ate and drank, who suffered a cruel death, who by the help of the certain gods triumphed over death and attained unto everlasting life. But what Osiris did, they could do also. These are the words of Budge as he was writing about this. And these are the key motifs that characterize the myths of all these ancient mystery godmen. What Budge writes of Osiris could equally be said of Dionysus. Uh, hence, we take all this collective and call them the Osiris Dionysus collection, uh, uh, symbolically. And it could equally be said of Attis, of Odonis, Adonis, of Mithras, and all the rest of them. It also describes the Jewish dying and resurrecting God-man, Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus Christ. So like Osiris Dionysus, he's also a God incarnate in the flesh and God of the resurrection after he rises from the dead. He also promises his followers this spiritual rebirth through sharing in his divine passion. So you're starting to see how Jesus Christ, the contention out there is this, is that the historical Jesus lived, have a hard time pinpointing him in history, have a hard time finding information about him in history, just like the Exodus and Moses, who I believe were real people and real events, yet really hard to pinpoint the history on him. But he is also, here's the question, that you have to ask, and that is asked as we study these things. Is Jesus unique in doing the same things that all these other godmen did? Or did his followers posthumously put upon Jesus all the attributes of the ancient pagan mysteries to appeal to the masses? Did Jesus die and rise from the dead? Did he do it in the same way that Osiris did? The same way that Dionysus 
was attributed to have done? Or are all these gods, was Jesus made into the collective God that everybody accepted so well? Down through the last several centuries prior to that. There's the big question. And the question is, since we have no real historical data about Jesus, other than the pages of Scripture themselves, is Jesus somebody who then was made into who he is? Which, you have to ask yourself, is there anything wrong with that? Because the teachings aren't changing. The giving of oneself, their life over to it, is not changing. It's the object of it. It's the the dogmatic, literalist history of Jesus that makes him different and sets him apart from the rest of them. And that was something that was brought to us by the Roman Catholic Church. So, the mysteries, they were clearly an extremely powerful force in the ancient world. Um, Let's review this for a little bit, these mysteries. The pagan mysteries inspired the greatest minds of the ancient world. Now, of course, within Christianity now, all those great minds are sinners that need to, needed to have come to Christ themselves, all the people who made that and put that together. So while they're the greatest minds of the ancient world, they are not the mind of God, we are taught. But the pagan mysteries inspired all these people uh, in uh, the classical ancient world. They were practiced in different forms by nearly every culture in the Mediterranean. They comprised the outer mysteries, that exoteric stuff, which were open to all. And the secret inner mysteries known only to those who had undergone a powerful process of this mystery uh, uh, induction in an initiation. At the heart of the mysteries was the myth of a dying and resurrecting God-man, the Osiris Dionysus. Now, keep in mind, too, that we've mentioned this, that Jesus was considered not just a good teacher in Christianity, not just somebody who carried on these mysteries. He was considered somebody who stood out because he was God, very God, who came down, God, who impregnated a young woman, probably 13, 14 years old, Mary, uh, uh, the mother of Jesus. He impregnates her uh, with the Messiah, and she's going to give birth to the Messiah. And it was without grand, great fanfare. Here is all of Judaism had been for all of their existence waiting for the kinsman redeemer, the one who would be one of them redeemer, to be sent from God. And you would think (coughs) that when God actually performed this, that he would let this be known widespread. Your Messiah has come. Here is me in the form of flesh. I have come down. I am here to redeem my people. I am your Messiah. No, it was to a, a simple country woman young woman at that. And her husband at the time, who wasn't her husband yet, Joseph, they were betrothed, so they were a young couple. But who knows, Joseph may have been an older guy. You know, tradition was these older guys would marry these younger women. Seems kind of creepy in our, our current day and age, but that's just the, that was tradition back then. He might have been an older guy. Maybe that's why he wasn't around and never mentioned at the time of Jesus' ministry the time of Jesus' death. We see Mary, but we don't see Joseph, and we hear nothing about whatever happened to him. Uh, you know, and I, 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 have to, I have to wink, wink, nudge, nudge. I'm 20 years younger than, uh, older, I'm sorry, than my wife. So I'm an old man to some people, to my wife. But we fit together just fine. We work just fine. So here is Mary. She's not married, she's betrothed, which in first century Jewish tradition was as strong as a marriage. They were betrothed for one year prior to marriage. And here she is getting pregnant. And what does the passage tell us? It says Joseph sought to put her away, divorce her in other terms, quietly, call off the betrothal. He didn't want to embarrass her, 
I think Maury didn't want to embarrass himself. My wife slept with somebody and she's pregnant because they weren't supposed to have sex during this betrothal period. And so uh, it said, uh, this tells you a great thing about Joseph. I think he really loved his wife and was really hurt when she became pregnant and she and he's going to divorce her. I'm just, just do it quietly. Probably went to his parents, dad, I'm just going to just going to do that. No. We're not going to take her to the gate and stone her. Just going to let's just be done. I want to move on. And then of course he has the dream sent to him by God, which says don't do anything negative to your wife. He said, or to your betrothed to marry. He says, because the child she's carrying is my child. And so this is all revealed to Joseph in a dream. And so he decides, I I can't do anything. This is the Messiah. And I've I've often wondered about that, the faith of Joseph, which we don't hear much about. I'm taking a little rabbit trail here. But imagine Joseph having this miraculous, moving dream that the angel of the Lord appears to him and says, Don't put away or divorce your wife, Mary. The child is mine. It's God's. This is the Messiah, the kinsman redeemer in her womb. God, very God, becoming man. And Joseph wakes up, I'm sure. Have you ever had those powerful dreams where you wake up and you go, wow, that was crazy. And it sticks with you throughout the day. It's like it was something very real happened to you in that dream. What is that dream? What are those made of? It's just the psychology of it. So it says Joseph had this dream, but could you imagine by the time he's drinking his second cup of coffee, scratching his ass, looking out at the rising sun, thinking, was that really God who came to me in that dream? Do you notice how when we have these wild experiences, if you're into the paranormal like I am and you do research there and you have these wild experiences and while you're in them, you are blown away. And I'm not talking weird, simple stuff. I'm talking the deep, big things. And then by the time you think about it for a while, uh, the next morning, the day passes and you're like, hmm, that really happened that way? Was I just sucked into it psychologically? I'm sure Joseph thought some of that. But you know what he did? He acted in faith with Mary, and he kept her as his wife. And when they ended up going to Bethlehem um, for the census, which there is is historical data for that if somebody told you the census didn't exist. It says the census by Tiberius Caesar, well, it was one of his his governors or one of his higher-ups that had done this. And... uh, They still were not a married couple. Uh, I take that back. They may have been married by that point because I do believe he was told, take your wife and feel free to do that, to marry her. And uh, they went off to uh, Bethlehem for the census, and she gives birth, of course, we know. Now, what is that? This is the physical story of the birth of the Messiah, the Jewish Messiah, the one who would be one of us, the kinsman redeemer prophesied as early as the Garden of Eden account, that uh, the Jewish faith, the Jewish people, uh, or humanity at that point in the Garden of Eden would have a savior, a kinsman redeemer. And then it all pretty much funneled into just the Jews down through the ages. And so is this God-man that was born, according to Christian tradition, is this the literal history Or is this something that was placed onto Mary, placed onto Jesus by his followers later, making him the living, then dying, then resurrecting God-man of Christianity, one of the Osiris Dionysus God-men, this collective down through the ages? What else did we discover about about uh, the the mystery religions. The inner mysteries revealed the myths of Osiris Dionysus to be spiritual allegories, allegories encoding spiritual teachings. So then you would have to ask, is Jesus just another one of these in that Osiris Dionysus collective that was an allegorical tale 
placed upon a historical person and became the cornerstone to Christianity, but in reality was just supposed to be part of the pagan mysteries. So ask yourself these questions as you go along. So the question, which intrigued me the most and still does, was whether the mysteries could have somehow influenced and shaped what we inherited as the biography of Jesus, what I just went through with you. Unlike the various pagan mystery godmen, Jesus is traditionally viewed as this historical person, literal historical person, rather than a mythical figure. And literally, he was a man who was an incarnation of God, who suffered, who died, and was resurrected to bring salvation to all of humanity. But could these elements of the Jesus story actually be mythical stories inherited from the pagan mysteries? You've got to start investigating the myths of Osias, Di Osiris Dionysus more closely, researching for the resemblances with the Jesus story. And <coughs> prepare yourself, wear your iron panties, put on your thinking caps, and prepare yourself because there is an overwhelming number of of similarities between the life of Jesus, what is called the historical life and ministry of D. Jesus, and the Osiris Dionysus mysteries. Now here is where this whole thing of diabolical mimicry comes in. Remember I, mess I mentioned Justin Martyr. Uh, he was a very early church apologist and historian. Um, he said, having heard it proclaimed through the prophets that the Christ was to come and that the ungodly among men were to be punished by fire, the wicked spirits put for the demonic put forward many to be called sons of God under the impression that they would be able to produce in men the idea that the things that were said with regard to Christ were merely marvelous tales, like the things that were said by the poets." So this is Justin Martyr. This is where that whole idea, that notion of uh, diabolical mimicry comes into play. And this was Justin Martyr uh, in his first apology that he said this. And so although the remarkable similarities between the myths of Osiris Dionysus and the supposed biography of Jesus Christ are generally unknown today, those similarities. People don't really know about these things. The first few centuries after the death of Jesus are generally uh, obvious to pagans and Christians alike that these similarities existed. The pagan philosopher and satirist Celsus, Celsus, C E L S U S, Celsus. Um, criticized Christians for taking, uh, uh, um, for taking to pass, uh, trying to pass off the Jesus story as this new revelation, when it was actually an inferior imitation of the pagan myths. Celsus said this: Are these distinctive happenings unique to the Christians? And if so, how are they unique? Or are ours to be accounted myths and theirs believed? What reasons do the Christians give for the, dis the distinctiveness of their beliefs? In truth, there is nothing at all unusual about what the Christians believe, except that they believe it to the exclusion of more comprehensive truths about God. What do you think about that? The early Christians were painfully aware of such criticisms. <clears throat> How could pagan myths, which predated Christianity by hundreds of years, have so much in common with the biography of the one and only Savior, Jesus Christ? Desperate to come up with an explanation, the Church Fathers resorted to one of the most absurd theories ever advanced. And from time to time, from the time of Justin Martyr, in the second century and onward, they declared that the devil had plagiarized Christianity by anticipation in order to lead people astray. And knowing the true Son of God was to literally come and walk the earth, 
the devil himself had copied the story of his own uh, of the life in advance of it happening and created the myths of Osiris Dionysus. That's what the church put forward. And there were all these, uh, I want to start getting into the Son of God issue, but let me end by this one quote because we're right at the bottom of the hour or top of the hour, the end of the show. Uh, it, was, it was Tertullian, a church father of the Roman Catholic Church, writes of the devil's diabolical mimicry in creating the mysteries of Mithras. The devil, whose business is to pervert the truth, mimics the exact circumstances of the divine sacraments. He baptizes his believers, promises forgiveness of sins from the sacred font, and thereby initiates them into the religion of Mithras. Thus he celebrates the oblation of bread and brings the symbol of the resurrection. Let us therefore acknowledge the craftiness of the devil, who copies certain things of those that be actually divine. That was Tertullus. So studying the myths of the mysteries, it becomes obvious why these early Christians resorted to such a desperate explanation. And although no single pagan myth completely parallels the story of Jesus, the mythic motifs which make up the story of the Jewish God-man had already existed for centuries before he did. In the various stories told of Osiris Dionysus and his greatest prophets. So we're going to come back tomorrow and we're going to talk about uh, uh, start taking this journey through the biography of Jesus and start exploring some of these extraordinary similarities. So folks, think for yourself. Put on your thinking caps. We'll move on into this tomorrow. Thanks for being here. We'll see you after this 23-hour break.